monetizing digital services since 2004, boosting the entertainment industry by making digital content accessible for everyone. AWG, where innovation meets monetization. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, where your source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development, where we share original research, explore industry trends, and interview executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We hope you join us often for practitioner-oriented content around all things related to leadership, HR, talent management, organizational development, and change management. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page, and please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Alex Vergara about why decentralized decision-making is so important in organizations today. Alex Vergara, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me, John. I'm excited. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be with you. You're joining us from Miami, Florida. I'm south of Salt Lake City in Utah. And today we're going to be talking about why decentralized decision making is so important and how we can create the decentralized uh, organization of the future uh, that I think more and more younger people people are, are desiring as they get into the workforce. As we get started, I just wanted to share Alex's brief bio with everybody. Alex Vergara is community lead and founding member at Earth Fund, the decentralized platform for a better tomorrow. And I would love to hear Alex a little bit more about Earth Fund, uh, but also is there anything else about yourself, your background, your personal context that you would like to share with the audience before we dive on in? Um, I, I think the story of how we founded Earth Fund is pretty interesting, um, but maybe maybe we can pick that up a little bit later. Um, but just really briefly, um, the idea started in a garage and I feel like most good ideas start in garages, right? Uh, me and, uh, his name's Adam Bolt. He's, a, another founding member, uh, started going into the rabbit hole of decentralized finance and, uh, decentralized decision-making. And we just, we realized the power, um, for crowdfunding and organization within the decentralized world. And that's, that's how we got the project started. So, so there's when we talk about decentralization, you know, there's different kinds of ways that that term is used. You were just talking about decentralized finance. Um, there's there's all the the talk around blockchain and cryptocurrencies and some of those sorts of things. Uh, that's one kind of branch of this whole general topic of decentralization. Um, but we're also going to be talking about it in terms of decentralized decision making within organizations because. Uh, you know, in a in a very complex, messy world where things the landscape's shifting quickly. Um, you know, there's there's not all the stability that may have been a bit of a facade in the past, but at least people felt like there's a sense of kind of some consistency, some predictability. And now, you know, we're just like everything's changing so rapidly. We have to figure out uh, how to to pivot uh, quickly, and it's pretty much impossible uh, to pivot quickly in a, in a healthy, meaningful, sustainable way when you have a, 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 a centralized hierarchical organizational structure. <laughs> Yet that's how traditionally most organizations have been structured. Uh, and so in, in certainly in recent decades, there's been some shift away from that, but over the last three years, you know, with the pandemic and the reactions around the world with, you know, global geopolitical and, and the, the global economy, uh, organizations have had to wrestle with how, how can we, decentralized decision making how do we how can we provide more autonomy get get decision making pushed down to lower levels uh, so that people can be empowered to be proactive and pivot rapidly and iterate and and uh, and move quickly all of that's really challenging so what we're going to dive into that a little bit more yeah so i mean you you mentioned a lot about the decision making and you know we can get into some examples on how our company has um benefited from rapid decision-making from a decentralized standpoint. 
Um, and, and also, you know, when you look at the younger crowd, like you were saying, people are actually looking for remote jobs. That's what they want. They want to be able to live in the middle of nowhere if they decide to or move to, to whatever city they want on, on a whim's notice. And with that, they're also looking for more autonomy within their companies. You know, there, there's kind of this pushback with Gen Z and millennials that they, they don't want to be managed. And I know, I know that a lot of people listen to that and they're like, wait, that's, that's not going to work. But, you know, allowing people to do what they do best and, and empowering them has the, the potential to be good too. Um, there's a balance to it, but this, this new generation is very different than previous and what they're expecting out of work and work-life balance. Yeah. Yeah. And and so for some people, uh, you know, that means to the extreme extent, like we, we want to be 100% remote. I want to be able to just have flexibility to work when, where, how I want, wherever I want. Um, you know, I, I think there is definitely some people asking for that, but the, there's a whole spectrum, right? And there's, there's people that do want to be in the office. Uh, there are people that want some sort of variation, hybrid arrangement. There are, uh, you know, there, I, th- I think there's every kind of uh, level of the spectrum of, of what people want and and younger people, I think, uh, d- uh, disproportionately are leaning towards, you know, the the flexibility uh, side of the spectrum. Uh, but even within that, you know, population group, that that age cohort there, you know, there's still people that want to be face to face or they want to do the types of work that really needs to be face to face. So it, it's the, all of this is a really interesting conversation. But I think even regardless of whether we're talking face-to-face or virtual or hybrid somewhere in between um, decentralized decision-making can be something that can happen in any form of organization uh, in any Absolutely. type of work. Uh, so even if you're 100% face-to-face in a more traditional type of office setting and in traditional type of organization, you can adopt uh, uh, decentralized decision-making kind of approaches systems, processes, procedures, uh, culture that will, uh, that, that can have a lot of benefits for your organization. And then certainly as you go more hybrid and even more remote distributed teams, it almost becomes a necessity at that point that you have to do it that way. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. And also it just allows for very quick decision-making, you know, uh, Mm -hmm. we've, we've come across uh, large bureaucracies, whether in government, government or corporations, and we just see they're very slow moving. And yep, we're living yep. in times that are very fast moving. And if we can use this software to make sure that we're making um, solid judgments, but, but moving quickly and expeditiously, then why, why wouldn't we use it? You know, and I think I think that's why you saw uh, decentralized autonomous organizations grow so much in 2021. Um, there were in the beginning of 2021, there was only 13,000 DAO members. And by the end of it, there were 1.6 million. So you saw this really large dynamic shift. And I'm sure that, that you know, I'm sure that uh, the growth rate uh, declined a little bit in 2022. But nonetheless, when you look at the demand for, for quick decision making uh, using software, it's, it's, it's there. It's the future, you know, I believe so anyways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, it, it's about just timeliness, right? You need to be able to respond quickly. Uh, it's one of the reasons why sometimes governments or large organizational bureaucracies, higher ed, for example, there are all these different types of organizations that get a bit of a bad rap um, because they're slow moving, you know. And on the one hand, they're, I, I suppose we don't want governments to always be rapidly moving because then you have Correct. social instability. Correct. But on the other hand, like you do need to be able to be responsive. You do need to be able to to uh, to be innovative. And, and sometimes that's harder, uh, when you have, when you're steeped in bureaucracy and when, um, you're really slow moving, uh, to adapt <clears throat> to the surrounding environment. Um, so all those points are really well taken. I'd love to hear a little bit more about earth fund and some of the examples, um, uh, around decentralized decision-making that you've seen, uh, at earth fund, uh, along the way of its growth and development. Monetizing digital services since 2004. Boosting the entertainment industry by making digital content accessible for everyone. AWG. Where innovation meets monetization. Yeah, so I, I think one of the, the, the first example, and it's, it's a very important one, um, had to deal with our vesting schedule. So when we launched the company, the token, um, we had a, a specific vesting schedule and the, the token was to be locked up, I believe it was for three months. 
Um, and that, that was the beginning of the vesting schedule. And then thereafter it was a year unlocking uh, schedule and there were unforeseen factors that made us realize that that, that was not going to work well for the company. Like it, it was going to put us under if we continued the schedule. Uh, so we put out um, a proposal within the DAO uh, and within five days, everybody voted the people that were interested in it. And we were able to change the vesting schedule of our company. And we delayed it for an entire year. And then we made it instead of it being only, you know, a year vesting, it was five years vesting. So everybody within the private round and the seed rounds were able to, you know, they voted on it, whether they believed in it or not. They saw that the, the company had long-term potential. So they delayed the vesting schedule and that happened in five days. So traditionally to, to make a move like that, to change around a company, a organization and structure, it would, it would be a lot more complicated um, but, but everybody that has tokens or was able to vote the governance tokens, uh, you can see it on the blockchain. And I, I kind of want to bring this back into a point that you had made about decision making. This also allows for transparency because now you can see who voted for what. You can see what their stake is within the company or, or government, let's say. And uh, you can easily compile that data uh, using the history of the voting. So I, I think that that's really important because... If, if you can see within your company, within the history, within what's happening, you can kind of sift out who bad actors are. You can see who's going to vote which way. Um, I'm sure in the future, you'll be able to use artificial intelligence to already make a predetermined decision of how people are going to vote, uh, which may or may not be accurate. So it, it just gives more depth and understanding into what's happening in your organization and more transparency. Um, so that was a way that we were able to move very quickly. Uh, and we were it was for the benefit of the company. Yeah. And the transparency and accountability piece, I think is a really important one. Whenever we're talking about decision-making, whatever kind of model of decision-making we're using. Uh, and so that's just an added benefit uh, as you were describing that. I, I think that's fantastic. A great example. Again, just the speed of it, right? Uh, so you, something that could potentially completely do your organization in, like you go under, you're, you're not... Uh, solvent anymore and and you can't even exist anymore um, that is an existential crisis kind of a, a moment for an organization and and you were able to respond quickly and then of course in other situations where organizations aren't situated to respond as quickly then obviously they just end up going under um, or or becoming something vastly different uh, than what they had originally you know thought they would be just to survive uh, and so I think we can't emphasize enough the the role, the importance of autonomy, uh, decision-making autonomy, uh, push down to, you know, if you're in a higher, hierarchical organizational structure, particularly a really large organization with a lot of bureaucracy, policy, practices, procedures that kind of slow down the decision-making to the extent possible, you want to push down decision-making autonomy so that people at the line level or, you know, their supervisors, their bosses, at least, are able to make timely, quick decisions to respond to the ever shifting demands and needs of the customers. If you're providing a, a product or service to the market, you better stay relevant uh, and you better be able to provide something that's of value to the market. Otherwise, you're not going to be relevant. You're not, you're not going to exist anymore. Uh, so pushing that down, I think, is going to be uh, very important. It already is very, very important. But as we move into the future of work, uh, where the rate and pace of change is only accelerating, uh, where technologies are continuing to push the boundaries of what we can do, right, and what people want, uh, we better be able to respond. Absolutely, and, and and empowers people that may have not felt empowered before. So if they have a sense of ownership, right, it's it's no longer the company; it's our company. Yeah, uh, and, and we've seen a big change in the past. You know, and in, in, let's say in this current generation of people wanting to feel like they belong to something, wanting to feel like they own something. And, you know, there, there's that saying that people don't take care of what's not theirs. So if they actually own decision-making within their company. If they own, a, a, let's call it a stake in the company, it's going to be very different, right? They're going to they're gonna look at it very differently. They're going to feel like they belong and, and uh, they put a little bit more passion into their work. And that's, that's what everybody's looking for at the end of the day, right? There are these cold machine companies that perhaps don't care in that, but you're seeing a movement of very successful companies that are empowering their employees. Um, and there's a balance to it too, you know, check out Twitter and how many uh, extra employees they had that weren't doing much, you know, uh, uh, no, no, no offense to anybody that was on Twitter. Um, but, but, you know, there, there's, there's definitely a balance, but you definitely want to have people feel like it's theirs, like they belong to it and they own it because they, they'll, they'll work, they'll reflect it in their work. 
Yeah. Empowerment is one of the greatest benefits that comes from uh, decision-making autonomy because you own your decision you own and you're accountable for it. Um, but you own it. And so you're more invested in it. And, and that kind of empowerment leads to higher levels of engagement and job satisfaction. It leads to higher levels of performance and innovation. Uh, ultimately, I mean, that's, it's going to be uh, better for the organization all the way around. And frankly, it's, it's those people, if, if it's the CEO, everything has to run up the hierarchy to the CEO, the, to the C-suite decisions are made then push back down the hierarchy. You're just playing games of telephone, right? And so it's, yep. it's slow, there's miscommunications, uh, and it's just clunky. Um, but if you push down the decision-making autonomy, people feel empowered. They feel uh, they feel valued. They feel like what they're doing is important. They are able to respond. They were able to, in real time, see the needs and address them. Uh, and that just leads to higher levels of engagement and and uh, better outcomes for the organization and for the individual. Uh, so it's really a no-brainer. Um, uh, other examples from Earth Fund that you can think of uh, around this decentralized decision-making that you've seen? Um, yeah, I mean, we we uh, we came to a crossroad. We, we were looking for more capital, right? So how how could we bring in investors into a token project, especially after this whole you know downfall of FTX and and this uh, strange time for cryptocurrencies? You know, we're, to be clear, we're a blockchain software company. We were leveraging a token uh, to build a platform, but you know, we're built. We built technology. We built brand new technology that that we believe is very useful for the future. Um, for especially for the future of DAOs. And we were trying to figure out how can we bring new investment money, large scale investment money? What, what's the way to do it? So, um, uh, you, you know, uh, to be honest, that's not my department in particular. So I might mess up the specifics of it. But um, basically, what, what had to be done, a parent company had to be formed that owned the intellectual property. Um, and in order to do that, the DAO made it, had a vote. And, uh, you know, it passed, it passed tremendous, you know, it passed without doubt, but, but basically the parent company was formed, uh, that would own the intellectual property and the Dow would own 20% of that company. Um, so you, you were actually backing the assets with intellectual property and with, uh, revenue from, from the platform. Uh, and it, the vote was done in two weeks. So, you know, we put out the proposal, we, we put out why we were doing it how it would benefit the DAO, how it would benefit all the users, uh, even, even people that, that were concerned with governance and what the empowerment of government, governance was. And within less than two weeks, the vote was passed and the company is being formed now. So there's a record of it. It's like, again, it's transparent. People know why uh, it was being done. And again, you're restructuring an entire company uh, in two weeks. It's pretty pretty efficient, pretty quick, and again, pretty transparent. So there's, there's a lot. I mean, these are just two examples. You can get into smaller DAOs, you can get into larger ones, but these were two significant things for our company in order to survive, in order to thrive. And if, if you take the time of both of them, they were done in less than three weeks combined. So again, talk about company organization and structure. You're able to, to make quick changes, make transparent changes and, and have people who are investors, who are workers within the company, uh, who are advisors actually make the decisions as well. Yeah, I, I think that's fantastic. And obviously, um, there's different different uh, types of organizations, or different organizational designs. There are different industries and different sectors. There are you know small startups versus scaling businesses, larger, well established businesses. So all of this, you know, becomes complex. You know, when we start to think, there's not a one size fits all approach to how we can go about creating more of a decentralized decision-making structure within organizations, because of course your individual context within your organization is going to be unique um, and you're going to have to figure it out. But I, I think one thing I, I hope is, is we're hitting home is regardless of your particular context, that you'll take some time to think about these things and think about how could you um, decentralized decision-making more? How could you push down decision-making autonomy to lower levels, to even to line levels uh, with people who are interfacing with the product or interacting with the customers? Uh, how can you make sure um, that these things are happening so that you can make these sorts of timely decisions uh, to respond to market trends, to respond to market forces, 
uh, you know, whatever it could be, you know, new technology that emerges um, that, you know, is challenging your, your own very business model. Um, you know, that all the rage uh, the last few days has, has been all the talk around chat and GPT uh, and how that, you know, this, this open AI chat bot software, you know, how this could be disrupting things. You people have been talking about disruption from AI and blockchain and other technologies for a long time. Um, this is just one example of one that's like super timely. Everyone's talking about it online. Could it change things dramatically? Yeah, it could, you know, and, and, and we need to be able to respond and we need to be able to have these conversations and we need to have the autonomy to be able to make at least key decisions as related to our sphere of it influence and responsibility and then be held accountable for that. Well, Alex, I think we could go on and on, but really this has been a fun conversation. I really appreciate the opportunity to get a little bit of insight into Earth Fund uh, and some of the ways that Earth Fund has tried to tackle these this decentralized decision-making uh, approach and, and process. Um, before we wrap things up for today, I just wanted to give you a chance to share with the audience how they can connect with you, find out more about your work, your team, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so if anybody would like to, or the people would like to learn more, you go to earthfund.io. Um, it's our platform. Uh, one of our largest partners is Deepak Chopra and the Chopra Foundation. Um, and we've, we're creating the tools for, for large nonprofits and foundations to create their DAOs, uh, to raise funds on an in international level. And uh, very soon we're going to have the opportunity uh, for people that donate crypto to get um, tax write-offs. So uh, it's pretty exciting. It's never been done before, but we're creating novel software for it. Uh, also, you know, if, if, if any, I, I would just say, learn about DAOs, learn about the technology. If, if you're listening to this and this is new to you, um, spend time on it. You know, people ask me, what do I invest in? Invest time in learning about it. When you think about DAOs in itself and 2021 alone, uh, the treasuries of all DAOs went from 400 million to $16 billion. That was in 2021 alone. I'm sure, I'm sure it's, it's shrunk a little bit since then it's corrected, but nonetheless, this is something that that's here. It's here to stay. It's the future of technology. And, and a lot of the next generation is looking forward to iterations of this and the ability to work with DAOs. So, you know, look at our platform, look at earthfund.io. Uh, we, we, we basically typed it up so even grandmothers could use it. So if you have no idea how to use uh, DAOs or what they look like, go on our website. It's, it's super easy to learn about. Um, also, if anybody would like to learn more information about how what DAOs are and what they look like, uh, my email is alex at earthfund.io. Um, I'd love to answer emails. I'm pretty responsive on it. And um, yeah, just just learn about it. You know, it, it's pretty crazy. Our company, uh, within a couple hours of launching, we saw a market cap of $400 million. So, you know, definitely it has the potential to to build world-changing technology and and be able to crowdsource from from people across the world like we've never seen before. So definitely invest time in learning more. Wonderful, wonderful. Alex, this has been a real pleasure. I encourage my audience to reach out, get connected, find out more about Earth Fund, find out more about what Alex and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. Do you enjoy the Human Capital Innovations Podcast? Enjoy ad-free listening by going to the Patreon page. And please consider contributing even at the producer or sponsorship level. And please leave a review. Thank you for your support. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.